So the topic that I chose for Mental Health Awareness Month, I guess I'll start with saying, my name is Yelda Ali and my work consists of bringing people together in safe spaces where we all get chances to share our stories, but many chances to listen to one another. And I am a strong believer that listening is an incredibly important component to healing and to connecting. And, you know, before we get started, I want to make clear, you know, this keynote is going to be about listening, um, but it's not just listening as in hearing people, but really holding space for one another. And holding space is about being present with someone and uh, being able to create that vulnerability and put your own agenda to the side and really just not make it about you. And listening really has to do with acknowledging that someone is going through something, even if it's uncomfortable. So, you know, why do we do it? Um, why do we listen? And before we get into the importance of listening, I wanted to just break down the reasons why we listen. And that is to obtain information, to understand, for enjoyment, and to learn. Holding space is powerful for both the holder and the receiver. It really invites a lot of connection and compassion and trust and empathy. And what empathy is, is that I may not be in your shoes, but I can imagine what it would be like to be in your shoes. Um, you know, I sort of broke down the five basic ingredients for listening. Um, the first one, you know, when you're talking to someone and uh, they're scanning the room or they're studying their computer screen or gazing out of the window, it's incredibly distracting. So we feel more safe to share when someone is giving us their undivided attention. And um, the number one step is put your phone away when you're listening to somebody. Secondly, listening without judging the person that's speaking, um, you know, making sure that you're not mentally criticizing that person and what they're saying. So if what they say alarms you, you can go ahead and be alarmed. But it's really important to not say to yourself, wow, that's stupid. Um, because as soon as you indulge in that type of judgmental listening, you have compromised your effectiveness as a listener. Three, um, listening without jumping to conclusions. So remembering that the speaker is using language that expresses their thoughts and feelings, and you don't know what their thoughts and feelings are. And the only way you're gonna understand what those thoughts and feelings are, are by actually just actively listening. Um, blocking out distractions, that's a really important one. So making sure you block out uh, the sounds out of your window or your own thoughts or feelings that are running by as you're listening, um, being able to block out, for example, your long to-do list that's waiting for you. Um, and lastly, don't be a sentence grabber. So there are times where we can't slow our mental pace. So what we'll do is we'll try to, you know, rush that person's um, speed up the other person by trying to finish their sentence and interrupt them. And what happens here is that you end up following your own train of thought and not the person who you're listening to. So holding space. Um, holding space, it's really important to understand that Holding space for another person is only helpful if you have space to hold. There are ways to effectively hold space for people as we hold space for ourselves, but you should never compromise your own space to give somebody else space. So what I mean by that is if you feel stressed, if you feel anxious or reactive or like you don't have the bandwidth to listen, you should own it. You should own that you don't have that space in that moment and be honest about it because it can end up being more harmful than helpful when we make physical space for someone to confide in us, but then we can't be present with them in that moment. Um, what I have found in those experiences where, for example, I have been like, yeah, I'm listening. And, you know, it, it, it makes the person feel like um, unsafe and it, it doesn't encourage them to want to share in the future when maybe you do have space to give. 
Tough love. Okay, this is a really important one because I don't think we talk about it enough. And I really grew up in a family where tough love was the way that we loved one another. And I, you know, I think it's important for us to understand that today we have more tools than our parents did. And tough love is not a real thing. Nobody needs tough love. Um, it's actually very much, an, it's a mask for not being able to hold space and for not um, knowing what to say and for lacking empathy. And I found that as I was getting older, I started embodying these traits. And actually, the more I loved someone, the tougher I would be on them. And it's, it's incredibly damaging. Um, it, tough love is harmful. And so, I think we should recognize that we don't know where somebody's mental status is and it can be really, really uh, negatively impactful if you tell them to just suck it up and get it together. You should have done this. You shouldn't have done that. So I really encourage everyone to be mindful of when those tough love characteristics that we have learned come up because um, it's not actually a form of love at all. It's, it's quite opposite to that. Yeah, so, you know, what are some things that we could say that are helpful? And, um, you know, I think what's important about these supportive sayings that I've sort of put together is that you're able to show support without fixing it without minimalizing it or without having to put a silver lining on anything. And I think that's really important because sometimes people, when they share, they don't want the silver lining. They want you to understand how tough it is, what they're going through. And so some of those sayings sound like, this really sucks, doesn't it? I totally hear you. Can we explore this together? What else feels important to share about this? I'm here. Um, and, you know, our goals when we're listening, yes, it is to remind our loved ones that they aren't alone. Um, it's also making sure that we don't take the responsibility of trying to change the situation. So how do we show that care without demanding that, like, once you listen to somebody, you know, sometimes we naturally feel like they're supposed to feel better and they should, they should feel different by the end of the conversation. And I think that's really important that your goal is to be with them in that sorrow or in that joy and not expect for them to change how they feel. And, you know, what's really important, you know, we went through the slides of it, it, uh, helpful things that we can say, but what's really important to remember is that it's not always about saying the right thing. As a matter of fact, what's really important is actually just being with the person. This is a um, B is greater than do moment. So really centering the experience of the person in front of you and being willing to, you know, compassionately be with them in it and feel curious and feel that empathy. And it's about paying attention and releasing the need for control. Um, usually what that will do is it creates more presence. And what that'll do is it creates more connection. And what that will do is it actually creates a feeling that is greater than any right phrase or any saying that you can try to memorize. Um, so I cannot, you know, emphasize enough that you don't need to say the right thing. What you need to do is just actively and presently be with the person. Um, and that that will make it feel right. So, you know, um, I can't repeat this enough. People don't need and want to be fixed. People want to feel heard. People want to feel seen. And um, what you can do, like your job as the listener is to really support the person's intuition, really supporting their knowledge and their wisdom and trusting that they can take care of themselves. They can take care of their needs. So being really mindful of what your responses are and what your defenses are when you're listening is, um, that's your job. And how can I make space for others and myself? You know, holding space, it provides such a deep respect and honor to that person. 
And being able to hold space for them and yourself, it's not actually as easy as it might sound. Um, you really have to engage in radical acceptance and making, putting all of those parts of that person and yourself into safe containers. So that includes refraining from fixing it, observing without judgment, and really not taking on that person's pain. You know, for five years, the past five years, um, I've been running circles around the world in all different types of cultures. And what we really found was listening is enough. Um, I know it's really natural for us to want to fix something and give people our opinions. Um, but when you create these vulnerable spaces where you listen to somebody, you find that they become stronger just from being heard and just from having their experience validated. Um, and so I, I really just encourage knowing that listening is enough. You don't have to do more than that. And um, when we started running these circles, the one, the one uh, foundational rule was that we wouldn't judge one another. And so listening non-judgmentally uh, can really aid somebody in the midst of a mental health crisis. And this is actually, you know, this is my favorite way to check and balance. Uh, am I doing the right thing as a listener? So I, you know, these are some questions that I ask myself is, what do others say that make me feel good? What are other, what are things that people say that make me feel bad? What kind of phrases have comforted me? When do I feel like I'm being heard? Uh, when do I feel safe to share and who holds the space for me? And when you start thinking about these things and you really start visualizing the people that make this space for you, you're able to sort of mimic what they've done for you and pass that along and do that for other people. So, you know, these are some really helpful sayings in my opinion, um, or questions that allow you to be able to recognize you know that concept of do unto others what you would want to done unto you is remembering like when have i felt safe to share and affirmed uh and really heard now you know obviously we could talk about this forever uh the listen the conversation of listening is one of my favorite things but as we sort of wrap up, I put together these three simple tips that you could take with you as you're, you know, exercising this new muscle. And it is a muscle, you know, the more you listen, the more you're able to listen. And the more you hold space, the more space you're able to hold. Um, so one is good communication, you know, really requires a high level of self-awareness. Listening has a lot more to do with you than the other person. So really understanding your personal style of communicating. Two, be aware that active listening can give others the impression that you agree with them, even if you don't. So it's really important to avoid seeming to simply agree with someone. And how much have we all been in a situation where we're telling somebody something and they're nodding and you feel like they're with you and then you realize they're not even listening. So really just being mindful that you are actively listening and not just agreeing with the person to sort of get through the moment. And lastly, you know, if you find yourself responding emotionally to something that somebody says, feel free to ask for more information, you know, don't sit with the assumption. So what that looks like is you can say, you know, I might not be understanding you correctly. I find myself taking this personally. And what I thought you said was this thing. Is that what you meant? And it really gives space for the person who's sharing to clarify what they mean uh, versus you being able, you just sitting in your own assumption. And then, you know, that sort of, domino effects into you then getting in your feelings and feeling distracted by your own feelings and then totally stopping listening to what they're saying. Um, and so that sort of like brings us to the, the you know, ends of this, this session. And I think that what's really important about listening to summarize all of this is it's just about being present with somebody. And if you're not able to be present with somebody, you can own that. There's nothing wrong with not showing up for somebody, but there is harm to showing up 
and then being in your own emotions and defenses and your own stories and not being able to give that space to hold. Thank you guys for having me. This is one of my favorite topics. Thank you so much, Yelda. Are you up for a couple questions? Yeah, of course. Um, I'm wondering, during this time that we're in right now, how would you suggest we should be listening? You know, in, in this space that we're in, do you have any suggestions for better listening during this time? Um, you know, I think that what's really important is step one, not only just to tap in and listen to your other people, but I think it all starts with self. So making sure that we're listening to ourselves in this time and making sure we're listening to our bodies and our triggers, um, being able to start with self really helps you hold space for others. So I can't encourage enough, like check in with your friends, but also check in with yourself and listen to your body and listen to your, um, your own emotions that come up during these precarious times. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, what does mental health mean to you? You know, mental health is no different than physical health and sexual health and spiritual health. You know, it's, it's a type of health that we all have. I can't, I can't express enough how much, you know, people confuse mental health and mental illness. And so where you may not have a mental illness, it doesn't mean you don't have mental health and it doesn't mean you don't have a mentality that you live life with every day, making sure that we're constantly in sync with, you know, sort of honoring, talking about holding space, like holding space for that mental health, each and every one of us. I think it's really important to break the stigma of you have mental health and I don't because that's not true. We all have mental health, no different than the fact that we all have physical health. Um, and so I might have knee problems and you might not, but that doesn't mean we don't all have that health that we need to pay attention to every day. What do you do to support your own mental health? You, what don't I do? I mean, you know, I, <laughs> I feel like mental health is everyday work for me and I am a really um, repetitive learner. So I love to continue giving myself information. You know, it could be just going through illustrations and breakdowns on Instagram and finding the right topics that speak to what I'm going through in the moment, or it could be writing them out myself and really validating what I'm going through. Um, I think that for me with my mental health, it's, it's, a, it's about recognizing every day I make space for it. And every day, whether it's meditating or eating healthier or trying to get exercise or um, looking at my emotions through journaling, I have really gotten dedicated over the past few years to making that space for my mental. Okay. So beyond being a good listener right now, what is one key action our students can take to implement in their lives today for their overall well-being beyond the deep listening and things you've shared is there one key takeaway you'd want to leave them with today um you know i think that it's just normalizing these conversations i think it's really important for us to look at our language and you know i i see very often the words that we sort of throw around that are like oh, you're crazy, and what a psycho, and the weather's bipolar, and really putting weight to understanding that these words, um, you know, they're, they're um, sort of demonized, and people that have mental illnesses, they don't deserve that, and every, you know, every one of us at some point will deal with a, a type of, a, a version of mental health that, you know, will not get better if we're not able to make space for it. You can't orphan these parts of you and you can't heal by yourself. And something that I heard once that was really um, important was, you know, we, we don't quote, we don't quote, we don't, we don't say like, you know, I'll just get rid of it and fix it myself when we get diagnosed with diabetes. And so when we get hit with depression, why do we think that we'll be able to overcome that by ourselves and that we shouldn't ask for support? And so I think that really normalizing 
what you're feeling and being able to ask for support and being able to be mindful of the language that you use is, you know, integrations that we should be putting into our everyday life. Yeah, that's really uh, powerful and impactful. Thank you so much for your time and being part of this series. Um, I know our so I honor it. So yeah. proud of you guys for the work you're doing. Thank you.